But this morning, I, I, I asked Pastor Peter, could I share something? And I, I guess, no, I'm not guess. I know we are all on a journey. We are all on a journey. And I know it's easy. I say easy. I know it's easy to, to think of things topically that we could talk about that may seem relevant to the situation. But I shared something last Sunday night, and, and, and there's a, something of a thought I want to develop from it this morning. The, I titled my message this morning, if, you, if you're one for titles, I'll give you a title. I titled this message this morning called Unquestioning Obedience. Unquestioning Obedience. I shared last Sunday night a brief testimony of what happened recently in my own life, but it's from that experience that I would like to download something to you as a people this morning because not only do I believe it's something for me to, to understand and know, but I believe it's something God is wanting to bring his church in to an understanding of. And if you and I are a part of that church, then I believe it's re relevant to us this morning. I'd like to take you to the Bible this morning and I want to share this passage of the Bible. It's, it's in all of our Bibles, so I trust you would have read it at some time yourself, but I want to read it because it's a story that's mentioned and it's, it's a story that's told rather than acted. Here we find in Matthew 21, verses 28, and let me, this is what it reads in my Bible. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But then he did not go. The question is, which of the two did what the father wanted? The people listening said, the first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitute will entering into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came not came to, to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. See, in this passage, we, one of the subjects is not mentioned by reason of a direct word, but it's a whole, it's a whole thing about obedience. See, Many times, and I, and I would speak even for myself by reason of my own experience or example, is that there have been a lot of times when I've had good intentions, but my actions didn't outwork my intentions. And what I mean by that is somebody, like it might be, it's like, a, a, well, I'll use a, again a, a church illustration you know, we get encouraged to pray and, and we're sitting under the sound of the word of God as it's being taught and we're saying within ourselves, yes, we, I must pray more. And that's a good intention. But it's not the intention that's important, it's the actions that's important. And so when it comes to unquestioning obedience, I believe there's something that God is wanting to restore to the church and it's not from a point of legalism, but it's from a point of honesty and truth and principle. Now, obedience to me is, is uh, as a subject that I, I can't say I actually struggled with at times, but it's a, it's a subject that I've learned. Even before I was a Christian, I was obviously learning obedience, and so were you. But since I've become a Christian, the whole matter has become to another level of understanding. I remember as a younger man, uh, my father was a very strict disciplinarian. He, he wasn't what I describe as a godly man per se. He'd married my mother who was a Catholic and he'd be, had to become a Catholic to marry my mother because that's what happened in those days. And so he was a Catholic by title but not by practice. But I never forget that he used to send us regularly as children. There were six of us in our children and the family. And we'd regularly be dressed up on a Sunday morning and sent off to church. And I still remember my father saying, you need to go to church, Alec. It's good for you. It's good for you. And I heard my father say that. 
But I remember one day walking to church with my brothers and sisters. We were all little kids at the time or children at the time. And, and I remember having this conversation with myself, nobody else but with myself. And I remember thinking to myself, if this going to church is so good for me, why doesn't mum and dad go to church? See, they were sending me to church because it was good for me. But that which was perceivably good for me wasn't good enough for them to do themselves. You see, the intention was right, but the action was wrong. And many times we also can fall into the same kind of trap. We can suggest to other people they should do things, but the practicing of the same thing ourselves is not something we actually do. We believe it's a good thing to do, but we don't actually do what we suggest they should do. I Please, I speak in front of Pastor Peter, but I remember being in a pastor's gathering on one occasion, and as someone who's been a pastor for over 40 years now, I wasn't trying to be presumptuous or silly, but I was trying to be very factual, and I probably get accused at times of being too blunt to people. But I remember telling these bunch, of, uh, these group of pastors, <laughs> these these holy people, I remember saying to them, "You know, you've you've given me permission to speak to you this morning, so I'm not speaking from a place of presumption. I'm speaking from a place of truth." And I said to them things like this, you've got no right to ask your congregation to pray if you don't pray yourself. You've got no right to ask your church to give if you don't give yourself. You have no right to tell people to do this or do that unless you're practicing it yourself. See, many times, even in our community around us, and this is part of the problem in our community, is that we have a lot of people that have answers for other people's problems, but they don't apply it to themselves. It's only when we begin to apply it to ourselves first that it becomes a reality of what we can speak and say. So when God began to speak to me about this whole subject of obedience, I honestly said to God, I still remember this conversation just a matter of maybe two months ago, now less than two months ago, when God said to me, I want to teach you unquestioning obedience. My response to God, and I have these conversations with God, I said, God, I thought I was obedient. I've been a Christian for 50 years. And he, he, didn't, he didn't come back to me on that. He simply said, I want you to learn unquestioning obedience. And so I said to God, what does that look like? And he said, I speak and you act. <laughs> Simple, eh? I speak and you act. But you think in your life, as I would think in my own, how many times have there been occasions when I have been in a situation where I felt something of what I believe is the prompting of God. But for some reason and for somehow, through the filtering of my own mind, I reasoned myself out of acting when I should have acted. And after the fact, I look back and I think, oh, I missed an opportunity. It wasn't that God missed an opportunity, it was I missed an opportunity. God was speaking to me, but I wasn't willing to act as and when God wanted me to act. I still remember going into the army when I got called up. I, I, back in my days, when I was a 19-year-old, they brought in what they call uh, national service for young men. And so when you turned 20, they, they had a, like a lottery barrel where they pulled out certain birthdays throughout the course of the year. And they, if, your, if your birthday came out, you were chosen, you know, without, without volunteering, you were chosen to go and do uh, national training or national service training. And for whatever reason, my number came up, uh, the 17th of April. It came out of the barrel, and so all the young men of birthdays with the 17th of April were called up along with other birthdays throughout the year. But I remember going, here I am, a 19-year-old man. I, 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 I was in a, a relationship with a young lady. We weren't engaged or anything at that time, but we were in a relationship, and you know, I, I had lot, well, we were been together for a couple of years and friendships and that kind of developing relationship. And so to separate myself from my family, from this young lady and from my work and other things was a major step. I, the, the, the government had made it such that it was compulsory. You couldn't say no to the government unless you had some medical reason. And of course, I didn't have a medical reason, so I was sent off. 
But I remember going to the Auckland railway station to catch the, the train, the troop train, to take all the Auckland boys down to Waiuru for their training. And I remember my father and my mother came to the railway station to see me off along with this young lady. And during the course of the things being said to one another as we were about to get on the train and go away, my father said this to me. This was his total instruction to me. My father was very short with words, but very other thing with other things, but never mind. I remember my father saying this to me, Alec, do what you're told and behave yourself. That was his simple instruction to me. Do as you're told and behave yourself. So I went off to do my army training with those words as a motivation to me. I don't know why he actually told me, but I'm glad he did. Because I went into my basic training, it was 14 weeks of training, they, we, did, uh, we did three weeks or four weeks, and we had a weekend off just locally. Then we did another few weeks, and that was the end of our basic training. Then we went to core training, which was the, seven, the last seven weeks. But I remember being there for about three weeks in this basic training program. And one day I got called up. My name got called out of a group of men. I was in a, a group, a company of men, or about 90 men. And my name got called out, Alec Larson. Well, in those days, they never used Alec. They simply said, you know, Gunner, I wasn't called a Gunner. I was in the artillery. And they said, Gunner Larson, will you please report along with these other young men that were going to report? And, and I thought, oh, man, I'm in trouble now for some reason. You know, you always think the worst before you think the best. So I, you know, I turned up where I was meant to be reporting to, and I turned up, and there's an officer in front of us. I think I was standing with about three or four young men. And he started to talk, and I originally, I really did think I was in trouble for something, but I didn't know what I was in trouble for. And I thought, man, if I'm in trouble with the army, I'm going to be in big trouble when I get home, because my dad would, he would add to what they ever did, he would add to it. But I remember the officers made this big, long speech, and then he said, and he said, oh, at this point of time, we, we have to, well, we, we are looking to um, promote people. We need some people to serve in, in the capacity of corporals, lance corporals, to help us do the job that we're trained to do or having to do. And so you have been selected to be promoted. So there and then in the camp at that time, I, I was given a, a corporal stripe in the artillery. We called it bombardier. I was a lance bombardier, one stripe, just one stripe. That's all I had. But that enabled me to have authority over the other men who didn't have stripes and so it was my job to march them to and from different places and things like that. So being obedient, you know, was a part of the whole process. I went through my training and finished my training. And after I graduated from my training, I mean, God was, I mean, I wasn't a Christian. You've got to understand. I, my, my girlfriend was a Christian. Her mother was a Christian. They were praying for me. I wasn't a Christian. If you'd asked me at that time, I would have said I was a Catholic still because I, I, that was the only church that I'd known because I'd been, my, my father, when he married my mother, we, he had to sign a bit of paper saying that he would bring his children up in the Catholic Church. And some of you know that system, but that's the way it used to be. And so we were made to go to the Catholic schools and Catholic churches. And, but I, I wasn't a practicing Catholic, I was just Catholic by name. So anyway, I went through all my army training when I finished my training. When I came to the end of my training, they had this great big passing up parade. And... Uh, I'm there, I've got my little one stripe on my arm and, you know, I try to be a good soldier and a good lance corporal, doing everything I was asked to do and doing it as I was told to do. And uh, when it came to the day of my graduation from the college or from the class, they had this great big parade, you know, big unit parade. And I'm on this unit parade with all these other young men. I think there was a total of about 900 of us in this particular camp. Each unit, there was four units within the, the bigger camp, and so my unit was called out, and my commanding officer came to the front of the meeting. And then he said, you know, there's some things that we want to do before we dismiss you and send you off to your units and back to your homes and families. He said, we want to uh, make some presentations. And I'm standing there just, you know, b being who I am and hopefully have done a good job as best I could. And in the middle of all this big parade, my name gets called out. And they, they call out this and they bring me to the front. And I, again, I, I, I didn't realize what it was all about, but the officer said, 
you know, we want to give you this award. And I've got, still got it. I've got this tankard thing, which they gave me a presentation of, a silver tanker. And it's got to the best all-round recruit, Alec Larson. And I was given that award. Anyway, when I left the camp, I had to take my stripe off <laughs> because it, it only related to the training part of my life. And so I had it while I was in the training, so, but when I left the camp, I had to take it off my arm. So immediately I went from being a lance corporal back to being a gunner. And, and I thought, oh, well, that's my day of, day of power is over. But when I got posted to my unit, I was only at my unit for maybe two weekends. And again, I called into my officer's room and he represented me with a unit, uh, with my stripes again. He said, we would like you to serve again as a Lance Corporal or Lance Bombardier, which I did. And I carried on my training and I ended up retiring from the Army after 10 years as a Staff Sergeant. And so, so I'd lived a life that was associated with discipline and obedience. But I remember this is why I want to bring it into the story, because when I was a sergeant, first made a sergeant, that's with three stripes. I remember my officer came to me one day and he said, uh, Sergeant Larson, I, I, we want you to choose some men for promotion. In other words, he wanted me to choose some people to, to give recognition to one stripe. That's that what I was going to be awarding them or I was going to be re recommending them for. And I'd never done this before, so I said to my commanding officer, Sir, sir what, what should I look for if I'm going to give people promotion? And he knew exactly what I meant. He said, this is my advice to you, Sergeant Larson. He said, look to the people who can follow orders. Normally, they are the best people to give orders. And I share this story with you because it's become the truth of my life. I've been someone who purposely practices obedience as much as I can. There, there is real benefit in obedience it applied in the army setting. I believe I would not have got any of the promotions I got other than I'd been obedient. Did I always agree with the orders I was given? No, I didn't. I, and maybe well be that you will never always agree with the orders that God gives you. But it's not a matter of you agreeing or disagreeing. It's a matter of obedience. And this is what God is looking for. He's looking for men and women who will obey. A scripture God gave me very strongly was 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel speaking to Saul, he said, Does the Lord delight in bird offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. I don't think we today have truly understood or do we understand the power of obedience and if there's something God wants to bring back to the church again, is a people that are obedient, not just with their lips, but from their hearts. See, you can, you can say yes with your lips, but your heart can be saying no. You think of the story that Jesus quotes about the two sons. He went to the first son and the first said, said no, but then he went. He said no, but he went. Then the second son said, I will do it, but then he didn't do it. And, and I would agree with the answer that was given. The first son acted in obedience, but he didn't speak obedience, but he acted obedience. Whereas the second one spoke obedience, but didn't act it. And I feel that all of us fall into one of those two categories. We often can become people of good intention, but that's all we are, people of good intention. I mean, let's bring it into the practicalness of a church service such as you've had this morning. If I said to you this morning, do you believe that praise is something God requires? I'm sure there would not be a man or woman in this room that would say no to me. You know, the Bible says this, God inhabits the praises of his people. So in other words, if, if God puts value on praise and we declare that he puts value on praise, why is it that so often we struggle to be a praising people? You know, praise should be something, is not, it, I'm sorry, Sister Teresa, it's not something that we, we're not, I'm not dependent on her to be a worshiper. 
I'm not dependent on the instruments to be a worshiper. I, I choose to be a worshiper in obedience to what the Word of God requires. In other words, my, my worship is not something that's generated from something externally. It's something that's generated from in here. Kiraborando, biando. I'm, I'm not waiting for somebody to give me worship or help me worship. It's worship's here. And all I've got to do is just be a willing to open my mouth and let it come out. And I suggest to you, start to make that choice. You have to start to make the choice. No one can put words in your mouth. Nobody can open your mouth. You are the one that's in control of it. And I say this respectfully. Some of you use your mouth for other things far more than you use it for you what they should do. You know, if, if God has given you a mouth, and you know, unless you are sadly afflicted with uh, something that impedes, stops you able to speak, then, then one day you're going to have to give a reason to God for why you don't worship. You're going to have to give to God a reason why you don't praise. The same is true of prayer. See, prayer shouldn't be the last resort. Prayer should be the first thing. It should be the first thing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. If you know it's the will of God, doing it should be the most natural thing. Like me as a soldier, when an order was given... It wasn't for me to question the orders. It was for me to obey. Did I always like the man giving me the orders? No, I didn't. But if he had the authority to give them, then I accepted it. Because there came a day when I was the one giving orders. And my expectation is when I gave an order, it was carried out. See, why is it that we have one set of rules for other people, but we don't apply the same rules to ourselves? We have to, church. We have to understand the power of unquestioning obedience. Do I always understand? Like I say respectfully, dear sister and dear sister, this morning I didn't come in here with the intention of picking you two out and you're trying to find a word for you both. All I have to do is say, God, I'm willing to be used of you. And while I'm in that attitude of being willing to be used of God, God lays this one upon my heart and this one upon my heart at this moment of time. I know he's going to lay others on my heart as the service goes on, but... But all I have to do is be willing to be willing. And I say respectfully, if there's something that God is asking of all of us, I want you to become the willingness of the people that you're meant to be. God doesn't have to twist my arm up my back to convince me something's right. I've come to a place where I truly believe I, I hear from God. And why can I hear from God? And some people say, how can you hear from God? I just, I choose to listen. It's not a hard thing, is it? If you want to hear from God, just listen. I say this when I teach prophetically. God has never stopped speaking. We've stopped listening. And we've got to readdress that sort of thing. And if it takes you to stand up and say, God, I want to say sorry, Lord, for all the times I've not listened and I should have. See, God is speaking. God is still speaking, even right now, at this moment of time. God is, I have no doubt God is speaking in this room this right now. The fact that you and I cannot perceivably hear it doesn't mean to say God is not speaking. God is speaking through the whole of creation. You realize that he's speaking through the chair you're sitting on. He's speaking on the carpet you walk on. He's speaking through these lights that are giving you light this morning. There's nothing in this world that God is not using to communicate himself to us. Nothing. Even that which seems to be wicked and evil, God can use it for good. But we have no perception of that because we've chosen not to observe it and understand it and know it for what it is. I believe God wants to bring us to unquestioning obedience. I want to share a couple of stories from the Bible, just parts of them, not the whole story because you, 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 are, you must be most, you must be the most theologically sound church in Auckland I, with Pastor Peter as your pastor. You, you, you must know all know your Bible from Genesis to Revelations, or in some cases, Revolutions. But, but you, you know your Bible from cover to cover. 
But here's one of the stories in the Bible, Genesis 22. Let me just read a few verses. Here's God speaking. Here, listen to the story. And then God said, take your son, speaking to Abraham. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there for a burnt offering as one of, on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had an, cut enough wood for a burnt offering, he set up for the place that God had told him about. That's the truth of the story, and the story goes on. We all know the story. It came to a place where Abraham is standing above Isaac with a knife raised, ready to plunge it into his son. God stops him and replaces it with a ram, and we know the story. But we need to go back to the beginning, right back to this part. When you read this part by reason of the direction of God, here's God saying to this father, take your son, go to a mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him there. At no time do you find Abraham saying, why? And yet when God talks to us, we've got all the why questions. Why God? Why me? You know, don't you know God? I've got all these other things to do and I'm too busy to do this. We don't find Abraham asking any questions. God spoke, Abraham acted. Even to the sacrificing of his son. Now I'm glad, I say respectfully, I am glad God has never asked me from one of my children like this. I really don't know how I'd respond. I, you know, I, I could stand here and say, oh, I'm a man of obedience. Yes, I am. But boy, this goes into the very hard basket. This is the very hard basket. I would suggest to you most things that God asks you and I aren't in the same kind of basket. They're nowhere near as hard as this. But here was a man who was willing to take God at his word and act on what God said with no why questions. Absolutely amazing to me. I don't know, that amazes me. That amazes me. But you realize potentially, this is the reality, the potentiality of it is this. If Abraham could do it by God's grace, so could you and I. That's the potentialness of it. If Abraham was graced and gifted of God to be able to do it, you and I could be graced and gifted to do it also, if need be. If need be, God could grace us and gift us enough to do it. And I know it would have to be by the grace and gift of God that we could do it. But Abraham did it. You know, he was not acting based on the wisdom of mankind. Let me read another quick story from the book of Acts, chapter 8, chapter eight verse 26. Another quick story. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, now Abraham, we can say, oh, he's the father of faith. Man, Abraham's this dynamic person. You know, that's the way he kind of like, we're now talking of a man called Philip. Now, Philip doesn't reckon in the Bible to the same manner that Abraham did, but nevertheless, he's mentioned. And this is what it says. An angel said to Philip, go south to the road, that, the desert road that goes down from Jer Jerusalem to Gaza. That's all he was told. This angel appeared and said, Go to this place. Go down this road towards, on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. Just go. And this is what happens in verse 27. This is his response. So he started out on his way. So he started out on his way. He acted simply on a word. Go. And he went. Last Sunday night, I think I shared with this church about a recent trip I took to Melbourne. I honestly say, in all the years of ministry, that's the first time I've made a trip like that. But I want to tell you, it was both challenging but also exciting. Would I do it again? I think I'd do it even quicker now. I've learned some things from the last time. For you that weren't here last Sunday night, just a brief overview of what God said to me. I want to teach you about unquestioning obedience. I said, what's it look like? He said, I speak, you act. I said, okay, God, how do you want when you apply it? He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to buy a ticket from Auckland to Melbourne. I want you to fly there on a Friday. I want you to go to a certain church on a Saturday, spend two services in the church on Sunday morning, be available to serve the church in any way they want, then go down the plane and fly home again. And I want you to pay for it yourself, find your own accommodation, but tell nobody you're going. Tell nobody you're coming. So that's exactly what I did. 
five weeks ago. On a Friday, I hopped on a plane from Auckland, flew to Melbourne, made my own arrangement for accommodation, went to where I was staying. Sunday morning, I turned up at the church and went and sat at the back of the church. People in the church had seen me four years before I'd visited the church, only once before. It was an Indonesian church. I sat in the back of the church and I could see people turning around and they saw me and they, there was a, you could see that questioning look, what's that man doing here? Because they knew I wasn't the guest speaker. Like this morning, I, I came here this morning and you know nobody looked at me with that weird look. Pastor Peter accepted me and put me in the front seat, but I was sitting in the back and while I'm sitting down the back, I, I saw somebody run up the aisle and found the pastor sitting up the front. Next minute, the pastor comes back to me and says, Pastor Alec, what are you doing here? I said, God told me to come here. He said, what for? He said, I said, I don't know. I'm just here to serve you. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm here to do whatever you want me to do. I said, if you want me to sweep the car park, I'll sweep the car park. If you want me to clean the toilets, I'll clean the toilets. If you want me to just sit quietly and do nothing for two, two services, I'll sit here and do nothing for two services, and I'll still go home satisfied. Well, he, he didn't let me sit there for two services. He got me doing something else. I didn't get to preach, and it wasn't my intention to preach. His wife was preaching that day. Great, she's a good preacher. And, but I sat there, but I served the church. But it had taken me to get off my couch in New Zealand to pay for a ticket to fly to Australia. This is a, a, it's a bit of a funny thing. I can laugh about it now, but I didn't think I laughed at it at the time. When I first looked at my buying my ticket, it was going to cost me $800 for the ticket. But because I had to do one or two other little arrangements before I left New Zealand, because I wasn't allowed to tell anybody, it took me two or three days to confirm a few things, and finally I confirmed it all. When I went to buy my ticket, it actually cost me $1,400. And I went back to God, and I said, God, it's going to cost $1,400. And God said to me, Alec, it's not about money, it's about obedience. I said, okay, God, I'll pay the $1,400. So I spent $1,400, flew to Australia, spent a weekend there, went to a church for two services, just to serve, and then came home again. Some people say, what a waste of time, what a waste of money, what a waste of effort. Let me tell you, it wasn't to me. And it certainly wasn't a waste of effort to God. See, that's what we do. We disregard things because we can't put significance upon it. See, your obedience is not dependent on what, how, what value you put on something. Your obedience is dependent on what value you put on God speaking to you. And if it's God that's speaking, then you better value what he says. Because if you disregard it, you are in disobedience. And the Bible says disobedience is a sin of witchcraft. <sighs> and that's pretty heavy stuff. That's pretty heavy stuff. But here's this man called Philip. He was told simply to go to a street or a road and walk down this road. I believe he would have gone there, just walked down the road, and if he got to Gaza, he would have got there, turned around and walked back again if need be. That's what I believe he would have done. But what happened on that trip? Listen to what happened. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, and the spirit of the, sorry, the spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay next to it. All Philip had to do was be obedient. God took call of, care of all the other arrangements. But so often we want we to dot all the T's and cross all the, t uh, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. You know, we, we've got so many why questions we give to God. It's time to stop saying why to God and say yes to God. That's what it's got to be. It's I love this man's response. He was told what to do, and it simply says he started out. Like me, I, I hopped on that plane. I paid. I, please, I'm, I'm only mentioning it by reason of significance. It cost me to get on the plane. But what was going to happen on the other end, I had no idea. And the truth is, I didn't have to worry about it. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to make my own arrangements. If it had been me and myself, I would have rung the pastor up and said, look, I feel to come and visit your church. I'll be there this day, this day. If you want to make music, I would have put some notice ahead of me so he could have made some arrangements. But I wasn't allowed. God told me I'm not to talk to anyone. I'm simply to do it. God wants to bring all of us to this kind of place where we, we drop all the why questions. I mean that respectfully. It's time for you to drop your why questions to God. If God simply speaks, then 
you must be willing to say, God, if that's you, I want to walk in obedience to what you're saying. Uh, you don't, if you reason it, you'll reason it out of your mind. I tell you, you will. I've done it myself. And God is teaching me not to do that anymore. I mean, here's another one, and I, I, I could tell you a story. You, you can read your Bible. You know your story. But what about this wonderful occasion? Here's Jesus in the temple, and he's having a dialogue with some of the religious people. And dare I say, I'd like to think you are spiritual religious people this morning. So he could be in this room this morning. And in the middle of this room, he observes a man amongst a crowd of people that has got an arm that's withered. If you read your Bible in, in Matthew chapter 12, this, this man's got a withered arm. The appearance of the story is such that this man was born with an arm that was less than complete. His arm was whole in the sense of the ingredients of his hand, but its condition was withered. In other words, he was born with this withered arm, but whereas the other arm developed over time and, and, and things that he did through his life and exercise and all that, this arm stayed no small. It actually got smaller than what it was when he was born, basically, because of lack of use. So Jesus spots this man, and he engages with him in a conversation. Now listen to this conversation. Then he said, Jesus speaking to the man with the withered arm, stretch out your hand. Now, I don't know about you, but if you read the story in the context of the Bible, Jesus doesn't even ask this man's permission. He doesn't even say to him, do you, do you, would you like something done with your arm? He doesn't even solicit his advice or opinion. He simply says to him, stretch out your arm. Now, here's a man who's lived with this arm within this condition for as long as he have, and here's somebody outside of himself telling him, stretch out your hand. Think of the dilemma. You think of it. You think of the dilemma. Here's a man asking him to do the impossible and giving him no reason for doing it. Jesus didn't give an explanation. He, Jesus didn't say, well, if you stretch out your hand, this will happen and this will happen and this will happen and this will happen, that will happen and this will happen. And this will happen. He gave him nothing like that at all. He said, simply stretch out your hand. So that man had a choice to make, just like you and I have a choice to make. That man could have said, I don't have to listen to you. I'm gonna, I like my arm the way it is. I'm going to keep it. And he could have walked away. He, he could have kept his arm. And I suggest that you can keep some stuff today if you want to. But the truth is you don't have to if you're willing to act as God would want you to act. I, I, I shared you with Pastor on last Sunday night a couple of stories. This is my, my, my mind's on is this wonderful journey of discovery with God. It's a, I'm, I think I'm... Well, I think, I know I'm in a better place than I've been for a long, long time. I, I, it seems like as I get older, I feel better. But anyway, but here's the story. You know the story. Remember the story of the raising of Lazarus? Jesus is away with some of his disciples in another part of the country. The message comes to your friend Lazarus. Your friend Lazarus is sick unto death. But Jesus doesn't come immediately. He comes several days later. He finally turns up. And as he comes to the city where Lazarus was, living with his sisters, one of the sisters greets him and says, Master, in other words, she was applying Jesus, Jesus, if only you'd been here a few days earlier, our brother would not be in the grave. He's, sadly, he's dead and we've buried him. The second sister repeated the same kind of instructions. If only, if only, if only, if only, if only. What did Jesus say? He simply said to them, take me to where you've laid him. So here they are and you know, it was like a trip to the graveyard, you know, like, let's go to the graveyard, let's pay our condolences, let's stand there and say thank you for his life and God bless you and go back home again. But that wasn't Jesus' intent. He goes to the graveyard and he's standing there and he, he sees the dilemma. This man that he loved is now dead and buried for several days. And then he gives us a wonderful instruction. I, this is where God spoke to me very clearly. He gave this wonderful instruction. He said to those that are present, roll away the stone. Now, I don't know whether you've ever thought about it, but I, I gave some thought to us and I asked God some questions. I, I love asking God questions because he never, he never lies to me, but he only tells me the truth. I asked God the question. I said, God, why did you tell them to roll away the stone? Because listen, when, when he said roll away the stone, th their answer was, Master, if we roll the stone away, there's going to be a smell because he's been bed, dead and buried for some time. You know, he's passed, he's passed your help. 
He's behind that rock and he's there for a reason. One, to keep him in, but also to keep the smell in. That was their conclusion. But Jesus said, roll away the stone. When I read that story, and I love that story, but when I read that story, God, I felt God said, you know, what do you think about the story? And I, I said to God, God, I only have one question, God. Why did you ask them to roll away the stone? I asked God that question. Have you ever asked God, why did you tell them to roll the stone away? Well, you know why? Because God, say for instance, say that speaker box was the stone. Jesus could have said, stone move, and the stone would have moved. He's, remember, he's Jesus. He could have said, stone disappear, and the stone would have disappeared because he's Jesus. He, he had lots of options what to do. But he said to the people, roll away the stone. So I said, God, why did you tell them to roll away the stone? You know what Jesus said back to me? He said, it wasn't my stone to move. They put it there. They should shift it. Let me suggest to you this morning, there are things in front of your life that God can't shift. You have to shift them. Yeah. You've rolled things in front of your life for some reason. And God's saying to you, I will do what I want to do and have to do, but you've got to do your part. See, it wasn't until they moved the stone that Jesus spoke. He could have spoke before the stone was moved, but Lazarus couldn't have got out. The stone had to be moved, and I suggest to you this morning, when God says something needs to move in your life, obedience is required. You move your stones and God will do his miracle. This is what un unquestioning obedience looks like. See, the Lord didn't seek their permission. He simply gave them an instruction. And I say respectfully to each one of us this morning, God doesn't need my permission or yours to act. God can do it without us if he chose to. But God loves us too much to do it that way. He wants us to take responsibility for our actions. He wants us to do things that are required of us. See, we can't expect God to do what we're not willing to do ourselves. I heard your pastor speaking about what you're doing over this next period of time. And I don't say this to be smart or silly, but I, I prepared a message for tonight. And I haven't communicated this with Pastor and I hadn't heard from him what you're planning to do in the next month. But you know what I titled my message tonight? It's worth hearing. What we've got is worth hearing. If you've got a, if you have a relationship with God, it's worth hearing. If God has truly touched your life, it's worth talking about and sharing. If you're sitting on your testimony this morning, then you're not doing what God intended you to do with your testimony. We all have a testimony in this room. If you know Jesus, if you're born again and you're saved, and you're touched by God and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a testimony. And if you're sitting on it, then you're wasting it. God wants you to use it, just like I have to use mine. But there's one thing about obedience that I find is very important, or several things, but a couple of things that are very important. Firstly, you've got to know who's giving the orders to start with. Like when I went in the army, I knew that everyone that had a, a stripe on their arm or a, a, a pip on their shoulder had to be listened to. So I did all my military training from the day I started for a whole 10 years. I never once got disciplined for anything because I listened to the orders and did what I was told to do for 10 years. I did that for an army. If I could do it for 10 years for an army and, and find it a joy to do it, then serving God and a being obedient to God for a lifetime should become so much easier. We, we have to engage in this whole subject of obedience to another degree. I, I, I really get troubled when I see parents talking about their kids. Oh, they're so unruly and undisciplined. And I look at the parents and see their condition. Yeah. Don't expect your children to be obedient if you're not obedient. Yeah. We, cannot, we cannot be people of double standards. In the workplace, we look around the, the unsaved people around us and we say, oh, look at those terrible, terrible people. But do we really take time to look at ourselves? Are we... Are we the best example that we could be? The best testimony that we can be? Are we as obedient as we ought to be? See, there's a wonderful man in the story in the Bible, and I use him just to illustrate a point. There was one occasion in Numbers chapter 20 
where the man Moses was told to do something. Listen to this, and I'll quickly bring this to a conclusion. In Numbers chapter 20, verses, uh, verse 8 and verse 7 and 8, this is what it says. Take the staff, God speaking. Take the staff, you and your brother Aaron. Gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out water. You imagine this morning, see that base of that column there? You imagine that being a rock. And, and God says to Moses, go and speak to the rock and, and, and I'll cause water to flow out of the rock. That was the clear instruction. You and I think simple, simple, simple. But listen to what happened. He said, speak to the rock and it will bring out water. You will bring out water from the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. In other words, this was not only something to benefit Moses, but was to benefit other people. But listen to what happened in verse 11. When Moses got to the rock, it says he raised his arm and he struck the rock twice. He did something he wasn't told to do. He went to the rock. He did, he did the right thing in going to the rock, but the way he approached the rock and the way he dealt with the rock, he interpreted it according to his previous experience. See, he'd been told to strike the rock before, so he was just repeating what he'd done before, but this time God wanted to do it a different way. But Moses wasn't obedient. And if you read the story of Moses correctly, that one act of disobedience kept him from the promised land. That's all it takes, church. One act of disobedience to rob us of our destiny. To rob us of our purpose. Oh yes, we can be doing 99% right, but if we don't get fully right, then we're putting ourselves in jeopardy. Moses raised his hand above the rock and he struck it twice. Water gushed out. Yes, the other people still got what they needed. The animals got what they needed. But it caused Moses not to enter into his promise. Remember when he comes to the end of his life, he stood overlooking. You would know the story, Pastor Peter. He stands overlooking the promised land. He could see it, but he could never enter into it. I don't want to be a Moses in that respect. I don't want to be cut off from my destiny. I don't want to cut off, be cut off from my potential. And it only takes one act of disobedience to disqualify me. Now that might seem very hard. If it sounds hard, then you don't understand God. God is not a hard God. God is a loving God. God doesn't tell us after the fact. He, he never said to Moses after the fact, oh, you shouldn't have done that, you stupid man. He doesn't say that. He warns him in advance. He, he said, do it my way. But Moses did it his way. And some of you are doing it your way. I did it my way. Frank Sinatra, eh? We're not meant to be doing it our way. You might think you've got a better handle on life than God's got. Let me tell you, you're wrong. No one's got a better handle on life than God himself. Listen to what my Bible says. The steps of a good man organized and ordered by the Lord. Who knows best about your tomorrow? God. Who knows best about your circumstances? God. Who, 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 who can you have total 100% trust in and confidence in? God. In all thy ways acknowledge him. In, not just in some of your ways, in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. See, some people want, they want to have God like this. God, we want you to be God on Sunday so we can come and bounce around in church. But on Monday, you go back to your corner, God, and we'll get on doing our thing. And when it comes to next Sunday, we're back. Oh, God, meet me again in church. Sorry, that's not God. That's you. That's you having your little weekly jig for Jesus. And I'm sorry, you singers and dancers. I love your dancing. If, I say to you respectfully, if you're going to jig for Jesus, make sure it's real. Because if you can't jig at home, don't jig in church. I'm sorry, but if I'm speaking straight this morning, God told me to speak straight. I'm not here to hurt or harm anyone. I'm just here to present the truth to you. This is not the truth of Alec Larson or the New Life Stream or any other church group. This is the truth of the Bible. You know, when God, when God speaks, he's worth listening to. There is a price to disobedience. But God remains faithful. 
I'm glad God is a faithful God. Has that like, have I, and I, I'm going to speak in very local terms, have, have, have I ever stuffed it up in my life? Yes, I have. And I, I would suggest most of you have stuffed it up too sometime. Yeah. You, you've blown it, man. You've blown it big time like me. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not God because if I was God, I'd just kick us all out the door and start again. <laughs> but God doesn't do that. But you and I need to take responsibility for our actions. We need to take responsibility for our actions. See, partial obedience is not obedience at all. The Bible says if you seek, seek him with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, that tells me that you want to be a people of complete obedience. You, you parents here this morning, do you want your children to be 85% obedient? Yeah, I know you don't. You wouldn't even be content with them being 99% obedient. You'd rather have them 100% obedient. That's maybe the ideal, but it's, it's what I would like to see. And so why, God, would, why would God want any less for us? But the wonderful thing of God, as opposed to you and me, my God's a God of grace and mercy. He knows exactly all the mistakes this man has made. And there's only one thing I've had to do to keep a clean slate with God. This is what I have to do. It's exactly what the scripture says. 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. If I stuffed it up, all I do is stop before God and say, God, I'm sorry for being disobedient. And that's what it comes down. See, we don't like calling it what it is, but it actually is disobedience. The moment you disobey, it's disobedience. It's disobedience. And God is looking for a people that have starting to move beyond disobedience. I'm shutting my notebook because I have reason to. Because I have to be obedient too. It's 11.45 and I was talking to my sister and she suggested that this is a good time maybe to finish. No, she, she, and she not, didn't tell me I had to, but can Pastor Pete, can I leave here now, come down here? But tonight, we, the major focus of tonight will be the prophetic ministry, as I've already said to Pastor Peter. But I knew this morning, and I felt this morning very strongly that I had to bring this word to you as a church. And it's not because God is angry with this church or any other church for that matter. But God is using me, and I truly believe it's an honor to do so, to ask people to consider what I've shared this morning and apply it to your own life. Young lady, I, I, if, I, if I could follow you around the rest of your life and just point out the mistakes you're going to make, I'd do all I could to protect you. But I know I can't follow you around every day of your life, but I know God that can. And all you've got to do is be willing to listen to him and he will keep you from making mistakes, just like he would keep me. Awesome, isn't it? That's how much God loves us. We've got a God that is so committed to us, he'll follow you around every moment of your life and give you wise and goodly, godly counsel and keep you from making stupid mistakes. Eh? Yeah. Eh? Keep looking at him. <laughs> but but this, this is what I, I really wanted to feel to share this morning. And if it sounds strong, I hope it is strong, but in a good way. I hope you don't feel abused by me because I haven't come here to abuse anyone. But I've come to tell you the truth. See, you can go out of here and dismiss what I've said, but you must then become responsible for everything you do. You must be willing to take full responsibility. Not me, not the pastor, or anybody else, husband or wife to each other. We've got to take personal responsibility. I'm accountable before God and so are each one of us. Each one of us, the Bible said, one day we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God and have to give an account for our lives. And one of the questions, God will say, what have you done with the gift of obedience that I gave you? And you'll have to answer to that. If you've used it correctly, well done, my good and faithful servant. But if you haven't, okay, there's a consequence. I, I, I'm not threatening you, I'm just telling you the truth. See, we must not think we got away with it. You know, how many, one last thing, Pastor, I have to say this. One last thing I discovered. My mother had, she had, she had x-ray eyes before Superman did. 
How many of you knew that your mothers could see through walls? I could be in the kitchen doing something, like taking a cookie, and a voice would come from way up the other end of the house, Alec, leave the cakes alone! She could see through walls and see what I was doing. Because she had already told me not to touch the cookies. But when mum out of the room, touching the cookies seemed a logical thing to do. But this voice from the other end of the house said, don't touch the cookies. And I believe God has loved you just like that. My mother didn't hate me. My mother would be willing to give me a cookie if I really desperately needed one. And it was good for me. So she wasn't stopping me having cookies. All she wanted to do is the obedience. And that's what God just wants to teach us this morning. Are you willing to learn? It's not an easy lesson, but I tell you, it's a worthwhile one. Because if we begin to practice this, I'll tell you what, it can revolutionize your life. You read the stories that I've read and read the conclusions. Everyone that acted in obedience entered into something good. Abraham became the father of faith. You and I are affected by that man's life today because he was willing to act in faith without questioning God honored, he's honored, we're, we're a part of the honoring of God through, through us to him. You know, I'm, I'm a child of faith by Abraham. Because he did something in faith, you and I are the benefactors of it. I mean, think of it. Uh, the only one in the story I couldn't find an end to it because I couldn't find a follow-up to it was the man with the withered arm. But can you imagine, you, you can imagine the excitement of this. Here's a man with an arm all twisted up. And God says to him, stretch out your arm. As I said, he could have said, no way, I'm going home like this. He could have turned around and said, this is the way I make money. I'm a beggar, and this brings me money. And some people do that. I've been in countries where they actually injure children deliberately to make them cripples so they can earn money from the cripples. Don't think it doesn't happen. That's happening in this time and age. Not maybe in New Zealand, but in other countries, I know that children have been maimed and hurt to become beggars, lifetime professional beggars. But this is not the story. This is the man with a crippled arm and a withered arm. And all he hears is a word from God. He says, stretch out your arm. All he had to do was be obedient. Can you imagine? This is my depiction of it. I can imagine him being there with a withered arm. And he's lived with it all his life. And he's probably had people talk to him before and tell him all sorts of things. And he's given all sorts of things to try, but nothing's worked. But here he's hearing this voice. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll just try something. I don't know whether he did it like this, but he might have even put his hand above his hand and looked under it and tried to move a finger. He discovered he could. Oh, I've moved a finger, which I hadn't moved before. He looked down again. He moved another finger. And slowly, surely, he took away his hand and he started to see his hand just become unraveled. And that which had no shape or form to it began to take shape and form. And the Bible said that he stretched out his hand. And if you read the story correctly, his hand became as whole as the other. That which had taken maybe 30 plus years to develop was restored in a moment of time because of obedience. That's what obedience can do. Obedience can bring about a miracle. Your obedience can bring about a miracle. Amen. As I say tonight, I'm going to pray for people more personally than what I'm doing now. My message will be short. The prophecy will be long. But that's tonight. But I I just want to leave that with you this morning. Can we pray? Lord, indeed, Lord, we stand on holy ground this morning. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what you yourself, Lord Jesus, did for us. And all you're asking of us, Lord, as a people, is that we would walk as sons and daughters of God, in obedience to you. Lord, not partial obedience, but full obedience. An obedience, O God, that will open the windows of heaven where the blessings of God will begin to fall. That will begin to experience a new dimension of your goodness and grace being expressed towards us. We pray, Lord, that you would just enable us and anoint us to allow faith to rise that obedience shall be unquestioning. Lord, let it be that even in this church, here in this place of the city, there will be people that will take hold of the message of this morning and begin to apply it to themselves, to their homes, to their families, that there will be a transformation 
And rather than being a church of good intent, it'll become a church of action. Whereby they're doing what you've asked them to do and accomplishing all that you want them to accomplish. I thank you for this opportunity. Bless this church and bless every family in it. In Jesus' name, amen.